Mexico, one plate at a time, is made possible by these funders. Five Star, unleash your genius. Brought to you by California grown Mir Glen Organic Tomatoes. Let's face it. I mean, most of us, when we're thinking about Mexican food, we're thinking about pairing it with some beer. And I mean, Mexico has a great history of beer making. It dates back almost two centuries. And things have gotten a lot more interesting in the last few years, just as they have in the United States, with all these beautiful artisan craft brews. But there's another chapter to this beverage story, and it has to do with wine. I mean, did you know that the oldest winery in the Americas was established in Mexico in 1597? It's Casa Madero. And this revolution in winemaking, well, it's happening in some of the most unexpected places. High in the rooftops of Mexico City, above one of the city's most upscale neighborhoods, is Vinícola Urbana. Here, surrounded by skyscrapers, they're growing grapes and making small batches of wine in a truly inner-city environment. My friend Marvin Namias showed me around this very unique project. Now, while they can only grow enough grapes here to do small tests, they're actually bringing in grapes from other regions of Mexico to this rooftop winery so that they can bottle enough to sell. Incredible. I'm looking around and I'm seeing clusters of grapes on vines yeah. and it's so such a new project and we're standing here up above Mexico City mm. um, over a posh neighborhood here this is really remarkable a truly urban right? winery it, yes truly urban winery we're standing in 500 plants that were planted vines that were planted wow. in 30 tons metric tons of uh, soil and what we're doing with the shoots now is because we're cutting now the shoots as these plants are growing we're giving to people to grow in their own terraces oh, so, so we're getting kids and saying can I grow this absolutely. in my house so I would, we got people saying can I grow 30 square meters of Malbec sure I don't know if I'm gonna be buying grapes not from Valle <laughs> but from Mexico City you know, it's a strange dream but oh, I think we'll have to get everybody growing it on their balconies there's around enough here. balconies in the city that's very cool so this is the Tempranillo this is a Tempranillo it's meaning kind of a small early. Grape. Yes, yeah, it, it, means, a, it means early. It means early. And even right. though it's like the beginning of the summer, these guys are already looking very And Rick, bright, I'm, I'm yeah? super excited because uh, we planted this a year and a half. This is the first year. <laughs> this is unbelievable. This is the first year we're getting, uh, and I'm picking one here, you know. Uh -huh. You can see these I'm are ripe. People soon. would think uh, these are ripe. But if you see the pit, it's green. So we'll be picking it in, in a while, basically. In a little while. Yeah. So you really are going to let these get fully, fully right. ripe. Right, right. So here's our urban winery. This is, this where, is the where magic. We make it happen. This is magic happens in this room. In this small room on that same rooftop, they're working with Mexico's leading winemaker Hugo da Costa to produce some wines made from grapes that are brought into the city. Now the process starts by putting the grapes through this de-stemming machine. Then those grapes are placed into stainless steel tanks, skin and all, where the fermenting process takes place. Marvin gave me a chance to try some of the Cabernet that they had been fermenting right out of the tank. I, I think it tastes like a cross between wine and beer at this point. It's not mellowed into it's what not we mellowed think of. It's roll, 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 roll. While that was an interesting experience, I was really looking forward to tasting some of their finished wines. Okay, so th this is wine made in Mexico City, and you've given it place names from Mexico Correct. City. We have Bellas Artes, the famous theater and museum downtown, and Revolución with a big picture of the Monumento of the Revolution, revolution yeah. here. Um, now, does it taste like here? I mean, I know it was made here. But yeah, no, the, the, this is the interesting part. There's all this culinary movement happening in Mexico. Yeah. So in the DF, we have 22 million people. We like our food. Yeah. a different way. So we make wine so we can pair with that type of oh, food. Cool. And we're basically naming them out of very special places out of Mexico City. Like okay, you you're holding it off too long. Come on, I want to taste. You want to taste okay, it. Why don't taste. we taste the white one? This okay. is a Chenin Blanc. Okay, cool. Right. So 2011. 
I'm getting some notes of like pineapple and honey and things like that, kind of tropical notes. Yes, absolutely. Peach, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit. I'm not sure. It's acidic enough to go, because it's Chenin Blanc, yeah. to go with ceviche. Right. But man, it would be great with a, a soup that's got some avocado and corn in it and things like that. It'd be really delicious. Good, good, good. Okay, so, so this one, what is in this? this? So Revolución is five different varietals. Uh, okay. But mostly Cabernet, Merlot, Petit Syrah, okay. Barbera. <laughs> okay. And, um, and Sifandel. Uh, this just goes very well with it. It's a very easy, easy well, drinkable wine. When you said all those varietals, I would think that it was going to be super big and in your face, and it's not. No, it's not. Oh, it's a e super easy drinking yeah, wine. Yeah. A lot of people don't think of red wine going with any fish things, but I think, especially if you got a red chili marinade or something like that, this would be great with all kinds of pork dishes, pork in a pipian or something like that. So yeah, really nice blend. Goes very well with a couple of things. Mm. Very drinkable. Why Mexico City? What? Why in the world did you want to do this crazy project here? Because uh, normally you have wineries out there and people don't have the money or the time to actually travel to these wine countries. Mm -hmm. So having a winery in the city and yeah. bringing the grapes, yeah. so basically you have the winery and you're bringing the grapes in, sure. uh, gives everybody the experience to actually know what a tank looks like, what the wine is. So you want this to be also a place, a teaching place? It's, where it's you basically, can... that's how we created it. And you said that you're calling what you do here basically your tests. Yes. So yeah, right. it's not something so, that is uh, going to be a big production winery right no, in the middle of Mexico City, no, but no. something where people can come here and enjoy we, learning about it. Mostly learning about it, learning about the process. Right. Very nice. Yes. Thank you so much for Thank you for hosting the us. Thank you. Salud. Marvin also extended an invitation for me to host a dinner party for some friends here at the winery. Now I knew just the place I wanted to go to shop and plan my menu. A short drive from the winery in Polanco is San Juan Market, which has everything I need. The first thing that comes to my mind with this market is the cabritos, because you don't find those in most markets. So the little goats, the ones that you can cook slow over coals, and I know I have the opportunity to do that. So that's the centerpiece, uh, if you want to say it that way, of what I'm going to cook. Uh, the second thing that I always think about here is wild mushrooms because it's an amazing wild mushroom purveyor here. So I want to weave that into my menu in some way. They have incredible, incredible fruits and vegetables, um, all the way down to different kinds of uh, edible flowers, baby vegetables, everything you could imagine you can find in this market. And you don't have to go clear out to Central de Abastos and wade through thousands of people and huge stalls. It's all really concise here. And then there is this great, great cheese guy here. I'm not quite sure what I want to do with the cheese in this menu, because I'm building all around that cabrito. Um, and dessert, I'm just going to keep super simple. So maybe I'll do cheese for dessert. Maybe I'll do some fresh cheese for dessert with some fruit and just keep it super, super simple. I don't have a lot, a lot of time to do my cooking, so I have to focus very clearly on just a few things with the most amazing products that I can lay my hands on. And this is the market to get those products. Well, I love live fire cooking and the chance to use a new grill is always a really exciting experience for me. So I, I'm, I got my plan, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cook these little cabritos over a slow charcoal fire and I got beautiful lump mesquite charcoal and now I'm gonna light it and let it burn until I get something that is like a mound of charcoal covered with white ash. So I'm making a very simple lime-based marinade for our cabrito, squeezing these key limes through the Mexican lime juicer. And they have so much more aroma than our typical Persian limes or Barris limes. So I'm gonna finish this liquid part of the marinade by adding olive oil, make it at about a two to one ratio olive oil to lime juice. It's a marinade, so I really want to add a good amount of salt to it. I'll probably end up salting the cabritos as they cook as well. Some Mexican oregano. Crush that between my fingers. A few chilies. This is kind of optional because I'm going to serve with a salsa. But I found these beautiful 
what are called Katrina chilies. So I'm gonna put three or four of those in there. I'm not taking the seeds out of them. This is just to add a little bit of color and flavor to our marinade. Now, roasted garlic, which I think goes in every marinade. These were done on the stove top, unpeeled until they were completely soft. They're gonna darken, almost blacken in a few places here. I've got a few that are unpeeled still in here. And you can see how simple it is to peel that papery skin off of the outside of it. But once you've roasted the garlic, it softens in flavor and in its texture. I think I've got everything that I need in here. Blend it until it is completely smooth. I have my cabritos over here. Half will go on to each one of them. And I'm of course gonna massage it in there with my hands. And I also want to grind a bunch of black pepper. I mean a lot, like a couple of tablespoons, because I'm going to add that as a kind of last coating as part of this marinade. For this, because I'm going to splay it, I want to make sure that the marinade is on the inside and the outside. Last little bit of marinade over each one of them, and I'm going to let them sit for uh, a couple of hours, I think, while that fire is burning to the right degree of hotness. So you can see that we've got the cabritos now over the hot coals, but this is a really special kind of grill that's set up for roasting cabritos. This are splayed open ones like this, but we've tied it in four corners there and then three places right down the spine to keep it cooking like that. Now, if I was cooking at home, I don't have this kind of a grill set up there. So what I would do is to just heat my grill to kind of low, and then I could do a butterfly like a lamb with the same kind of marinade. I could do a butterfly chicken, and I would cook it the same way, low, slow, smoky, just like we're doing with this one. Now, you can see it's skin side up here, and I'm gonna cook it mostly that way. I'm actually gonna turn this on so that I can get it to sort of flatten out like that. And I'm gonna cook it with the heat coming up and penetrating through the bones on that side at the very end. I'll rotate it back around and let the skin brown nicely. It'll take for these probably around three hours or so. to show you how to make what I call adobo verde or green adobo made from green chilies and garlic and olive oil and herbs. It's my all-purpose go-to seasoning. I make a big jar of it, keep it in my refrigerator. It'll last for several months as long as you keep a little film of oil on the top of it. Now the first steps to making it are to roast garlic and roast serrano or jalapeno chilies, and I've already done that. I roasted them in a dry skillet until they were completely soft. That's the most important thing here. Take the stems off the roasted serrano chilies. I'm using four, but of course you could adjust the number depending on how spicy you like it. Give the chilies and the garlic a rough chop, and then scoop them into the blender. Next, take a big handful of cilantro, cut off the lower stems, and give the rest a rough chop before putting that into the blender too. Do the same with a handful of parsley. Add about two teaspoons of salt, a cup of olive oil, and then blend it all together. Typically, I pour this into a jar and store it in the refrigerator till I'm ready to use it. Today, I'm ready to use it, so I'm just gonna leave it right in the blender jar. A lot of people say they don't like chayote because they think it's kind of watery and tasteless. So I'm gonna show you a way to make chayote so utterly delicious that it'll become high on your list of ways to prepare any vegetable. So I'm cutting the seeds out of the chayote 
and without peeling it, because I think it's got a tender skin, so I don't peel it, I'm gonna cut it into roughly one inch chunks. I'm making a large batch of chayote for my party tonight. I put it all into a large roasting pan here and drizzle it with olive oil. And then sprinkle it with salt. I'm using this beautiful salt from the western coast of Mexico, the Colima salt. Generous amount on here. Now crushed black pepper over that. And now I'm gonna roast it. At home, it'd probably be in my regular oven, but here, since I've got this wood-burning oven, that's where I'm gonna roast the chayote. Now, if the temperature is what I think it is, it's gonna take me 20 to 25 minutes to get those chayote completely soft through and beautifully browned. To go with the slow roasted cabrito, I decided to do a salsa, but it is a salsa you may not have come across before because I found these beautiful eggplants, small eggplants at the San Juan market. And I thought, gosh, if we just grilled them until they were charred on the outside and used their really creamy flesh to thicken a salsa that's made from roasted tomatoes, maybe some chipotle chili, we could do something that was really amazing. So we're trying this out today, okay? So I've got three of these eggplants, I got a whole bunch of tomatoes, and I'm gonna take all of this to the grill along with some whole garlic cloves, and I'm gonna do red onion for this because I think the sweetness will be really good with the eggplant, cut the top and bottom off, and then the rest of it into about a little less than half inch rounds. And then all of this is gonna go onto the grill. I'm gonna roast it, grill roast it until it's beautifully browned and completely soft on the inside. To finish the eggplant salsa, I'm gonna scoop chopped red onion into a bowl, add the tomatoes chopped up, and some cilantro chopped up. plant part of this, which is kind of the most the interesting part to me because it makes a beautiful creamy salsa. Roughly chop that roasted garlic, then put it into the blender with a few chipotle chilies from a can, along with a couple of tablespoons of that tangy canning liquid. That'll go on there and now to the eggplant. These have roast it on the grill until their skin is completely charred and the flesh is very soft on the inside. I mean, they'll really look charred on the outside. That shouldn't alarm you at all. Cut the tops off like that and then split them so you can open them up in half. And then I'm gonna use a spoon to scrape that very soft flesh from the charred skin and add it directly to the blender jar. And blend this mixture until it's smooth. Scrape the eggplant and chipotle and garlic puree into the mix. Season it with salt and a little bit of lime juice. Give it a taste. It's gonna be good with that caprito. The chayote is 
beautifully tender, really super sweet, which will amaze you if you've never roasted chayote before. Combine a good amount of your herby green adobo over the top of the roasted chayote. Add some lime zest, some fresh squeezed lime juice to perk up all the flavors. Mix it all together and scoop it into a serving dish. I'm adding some fresh goat cheese over the top. You could also use queso fresco or feta. A little bit of cilantro to top things off and you're ready to serve. Okay, best laid plans. It started raining, but we're still gonna go through with this beautiful dinner party. Well, I hope we're gonna go through with this beautiful dinner party. No, we are, we are. And I'm gonna show you how to make my sort of go-to special occasion tostada as a little pass around appetizer. It's made with some cooked shrimp. So I've got cooked shrimp here cut into pieces. Super simple. A Little bit of chopped onion goes over the top of that. I like to rinse the onion off after I chop it so that I can make sure it has the freshest, brightest, cleanest flavor. Some chopped fresh tomato on that, and then an avocado sauce. So you can see it's very classic flavors here. I've got a couple of ripe avocados go around the pit, twist the two sides apart, take the uh, pit out of the avocado, scoop the avocado flesh from the skin into the blender jar. To that, add a little bit of cilantro and give it a little rough chop. Squeeze some fresh lime. Add that to the blender. I'm adding a couple of spicy serrano chilies as well. Then blend everything until it's smooth. Thin it out with a little bit of water. Season it with salt. Blend it together a bit more, and then add that to your shrimp mixture. That's nicely mixed. I've got beautiful tostadas. You can buy tostadas pretty much anywhere in the United States, but here in Mexico, you can get some very distinctive ones, like this one that has toasted sesame seeds in it, which I think is gonna be beautiful with this very fresh tostada of avocado, tomato, and beautiful fresh Gulf shrimp. A Little bit more chopped fresh tomato on top of it. And a very nice leaf of cilantro on top of that makes a very simple, very special pass around appetizer for your rainy dinner party. Okay, so here's the slow roasted cabrito, uh, marinated with uh, roasted garlic and uh, lime juice and olive oil. Perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> start going there. Take the uh, pit out of the avocado. Wow. 
Okay, so I fired up your appetite. Some of my favorite dishes, entertaining tips, and Mexican travel inspirations. Well, now I want to hear what you have to say. Visit us at rickbayless.com slash TV for recipes and a whole lot more. This program was made possible by Five Star, unleash your genius. Brought to you by California-grown Mir Glen Organic Tomatoes.